Dithda, we are the Story Republic. In normal circumstances, this summer we would be sharing our stories and performing our poems for you on beaches, on the streets, at festivals, you name it, we'd be there. However, as we are all painfully aware, summer 2020 is not exactly a normal one. And that is why we are beyond excited to be part of the Causley Festival of Arts and Literature. And we are so grateful to be part of it. We are the Story Republic. We travel around Cornwall bringing stories, songs and poems with a bit of a Cornish twist. And one of our greatest inspirations is the namesake of this festival, Charles Causley himself. And so today we are bringing you a selection of our favourites, heavily influenced by land and sea. Some of these poems have been set to music by the newly musician Rick Williams, the first of which you will hear in just a moment. We will also be featuring stories written by Anna Maria Murphy, Penny Gunter and Amanda Harris. My name is Connie Crosby, I am a Story Republican and I will be performing for you alongside Keith Sparrow and Nina Hills. We really hope you enjoy what we've got for you. Johnny, Johnny come, come over, over the water and make the sun shine through. Johnny, come over the water and paint the sky with blue. Cover the fields and the meadows with flowers of red and gold. And cover with leaves the simple trees that stand so bare and cold. Johnny, come over the water, turn the white grass to hay. It's winter, winter all the year Since you went away Since you went away Johnny, come over the water Johnny, come over the water And make the sun shine through Johnny, come over the water And paint, paint the sky with blue And paint the sky with blue And paint the sky with blue Johnny, Johnny come, come over, over the water. My young man's a Cornish man. He lives in Camborne town. I met him going up the hill as I was coming down. His eye is bright as Dolkhurst tin, his body as china clay. His hair is as dark as Warrington wood upon St Thomas Day. He plays the rugby football game on a Saturday afternoon, and we shall walk on Wilsey Down under the bouncing moon. <sighs> My young man's a Cornish man, he won't leave me in the lurch, and one day we will married be up to Truro Church. Well, he's bought me a ring of Cornish gold, a belt of copper made, and at Bobman Fair for my wedding dress a purse of silver paid. And I shall give him a scalded cream and starry gazy pie, and make him a saffron cake for tea, and a pasty for by and by. O oh, den yoing kukerno, evu den yoing gwir, ha den kernuik gans morin gernuik he talbos hemmerin whir. <laughs> what she said was, my young man's a Cornish man, a proper young man is he, and a Cornish man and a Cornish maid is how it belongs to be. That's what I said. Hawthorn white, hawthorn red, hanging in the garden at my head. Tell me simple, tell me true, when winter comes what must I do? I have a house with chimneys for a silver bell upon the door. A single heart and a single bed, that's not enough, the Hawthorn said. Hello Charles Causley Festival. Uh, this story was written on a walk that started from Charles Causley's house, Cypress Well, 
guided by Lynn Caudle, who told me a story of two sisters who married two brothers. Two sisters for two brothers. The road to Truscott is a tangle of tufted vetch, meadow sweet and campion. You may not know that if you touch a campion, your blood will flow round the other way. We know this because when Cyril Tresida fell down the treacle mines at Langor, he was cut to the bone and we saw it do that very thing. If you were passing through, you could never guess that the Truscott Pond was well known for courting, ideal for this purpose due to the cover of the towering yellow flag iris. Saturday nights were a good time for loving, and that's true of anywhere, not just Truscott. Also handy for confession on the Sunday in the chapel, if you were that way inclined. The stitchwort and milkmaid flowers that carpeted the banks of the pond were often to be found flattened on a Sunday morning, where heads and other parts had lain. The scent of hawthorn intoxicating for those who didn't know that they were in love. Cyril Tresida, the one whose blood flowed the other way, loved Ivy and Ivy loved Cyril, but Cyril thought that Ivy loved Alfred, who was his brother, and Ivy thought that Cyril loved Gwen, who was her sister, and Alfred thought that Gwen loved Cyril, and Gwen thought that Alfred loved Ivy. But really, Cyril loved Ivy, and Ivy loved Cyril, and Alfred loved Gwen, and Gwen loved Alfred. This was because when Cyril came calling at the two sisters' house, he was so overcome with love for Ivy, he could only speak to Gwen. And Alfred was so overcome with love for Gwen that he only spoke to Ivy. This went on for years. Ivy would leave the room when Cyril came. She would go to her room and soak the bed with tears, whilst Gwen and Cyril would discuss the weather and the types of rain that had fallen that week to the tea that neither of them had drunk had gone cold. And Gwen left Ivy with Alfred when he came round, and Gwen would go to the barn outside and kick seven types of hell out of the tractor. If it hadn't been for a scarf that Ivy always wore around her hair to keep her wild curls from escaping, the truth may never have been discovered. She left it on the back of the chair that Cyril was sitting on during one of the unbearable visits and conversations about rain. Gwen left the room to refill the teapot and take her frustration out on the stove or the dresser or the cat. And as she stood in the doorway to return, she saw that Cyril had taken Ivy's scarf and smothered his face in it. It, of course, smelt of her the scent of heather and gorse. Gwen's scent was more hay and grass. Ivy, he said under his breath. Oh, Ivy. And they married. In spring, the hawthorn blossom falling on them like confetti. Ivy to Cyril and Gwen to Alfred. And they lived together in Tresida House. Or they did, as they are gone now, like the treacle mines of Langor. So, take my advice. If you love someone, tell them straight away. There's no time to waste. They are waiting for me, somewhere beyond Eden Rock. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack still two years old and trembling at his feet. My mother, 23, in a sprig dress drawn at the waist. Ribbon in her straw hat has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. She pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork. Slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water. Leisurely they beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call, see where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought it would be like this. 
I love a cup of tea, I mean. I love a tea cup. I have a set that went from grandmother to mother, from mother to me, from mother to me. And when there are angels, angels singing around us, us, you feel so blessed with tea in a china cup. When there are angels, angels singing around us, us, you feel so blessed with tea in a china cup. It is so fine that when you hold it up, you can see right through it. That's the sign of real porcelain, even when it is full of tea, it's light as a feather. And when there are angels singing around us, you feel so blessed with tea in a china cup. And when there are angels singing around us, you feel so blessed with tea in a China cup. I love a cup of tea. I love a cup of tea. I love a cup of tea. Charity Chadder borrowed a ladder and lent it against the moon. She climbed to the top without a stop on the 31st of June. Brought down every single star and kept them all in a pickle jar. Robert Stephen Hawker, vicar of Morwenstow, dressed himself in a merry maid skin, swam out with the flow, and with a coral branch he combed his hair so limp and long, and high in a screamy voice he sang a seaweedy sort of song. From near and far the people came to walk on the clifftop green, for none had heard a merry maid sing, nor ever a merry maid seen. The first night that the merry maid sang, the moon was as white as bone. And sad was the song they heard her sing as she sat on a slippery stone. The second night the merry maid sang, the moon was beaming brass. And sweet was the song they heard her sing as she gazed in her looking glass. The third night the merry maid sang, the moon was thin and pale. And when she had sung her sweet sad song, she stood straight up on her tail. As stiff as a soldier, she stood up in a phosphorescent sheen, and with arms straight down by her side, she sang, God save our gracious queen. Then into the dancing sea she dove to the running billows roar, and vanished beneath the wheeling waves and was seen on the coast no more. Robert Stephen Hawker, vicar of Morwenstow, stripped himself of the merry maid skin he wore from top to toe. And the vicar, he smiled and pondered, as he went upstairs to bed, on the gullibility of man, and sadly shook his head. Oh, the lonely cat has taken my lover from me. Oh, the lonely cat has taken my lover from me. There was once a village of fisherwomen. From the skipper to the spotters, the packers to the netters, there wasn't a man to be seen. No, here the waves march in alto and the west winds soothe in soprano. There are no footfalls behind you, no fear to be on the beach at night. There are no fistfights at the pub, 
But the bruises spring from words. And the women here collect gossip alongside the seaweed left behind on the sand. And so their skin is made thick by more than years and weather. Although sometimes there is the echo of a lost tenor when the spring tide is low. And sometimes there is a baritone's whisper when the wind falls away from the water. The men, or so the women say, were from the same stock as the fish they caught. Slimy, gasping for conversation, quick to escape the net of commitment. And the women here, who weren't allowed to haul the nets then, who weren't allowed to feel the roll of the waves then, who weren't allowed much then, they heard the phrase, plenty more fish in the sea, and they thought, wouldn't that be nice? And so the women harness the power of the moon as women folk are wont to do and they gathered the menfolk onto the beach and they sent the men into the sea. And now in this place the only thing left of the menfolk is not the base of their voices but the exceptionally prize-winning bass fish which the women sell for gold at the market. Go find another tender maiden in the hope that she might be your wife for I've been warned and I've decided to sleep Nightingale's tongues, Your Majesty? Quails in aspic cost a purse of money. Oysters from the deep raving sea. Grapes and Greek honey. Beads of black caviar from the Caspian. Rock melon with corn of the cobbin. Take it all away, grumbled the old King of Cornwall. Bring me some figgy hobby in. Devilled lobster, your majesty, Scots kale, brose or broth, grilled mackerel with gooseberry sauce, cider ice that melts in your mouth, pears filled with a nut or date salad, Christmas pudding with a tanner or a bobbin. Take it all away groused the old king of Cornwall. Bring me some figgy hobbin. Amber jelly, your majesty. Passion fruit flummery. Mm. Pineapple sherbet, milk punch or pavlova cake. Sugary, summery. Carpet bag steak. Blueberry grunt, cinnamon crescents, spaghetti as fine as the thread on a bobbin. Take it all away, grizzled the old king of Cornwall. Bring me some figgy hobbin. So, in from the kitchen came figgy hobbin, shining and speckled with raisins sweet. And though on the king of Cornwall's land the rain it fell and the wind it beat, as soon as a forkful of figgy hobbin up to his lips he drew. <sighs> Over the palace a pure sun shone and the sky was blue. That's what I wanted. He smiled, his face now as bright as the breast of the robin. Ah, to cure the sickness of the heart, bring me some figgy hobbin. Hi, uh, my name's Amanda Harris and I'm the director of KEEP, Kernow Education Arts Partnership and the Story Republic. Uh, and I also like writing stories. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Charles Causley many years ago and uh, have since worked and loved his poetry. 
This story is inspired by Figgy Hobbin. Uh, I think in my imagination it's set in Truro, but let's for today imagine it's Lanson. To cure the sickness of the heart. It was raining as they waited for the bus. The wind whipped up the surface water and spat it against their ankles. The lights from the shops shone a melancholy yellow in the winter evening. For several days, Jack had noticed a young woman bundled in a big winter coat and woolen hat with ear flaps. Wisps of fair hair escaped from the bundle. He could hardly see her face, but she seemed shrouded in a cloak of sadness. This drew the kind-hearted Jack to her. One evening, he plucked up courage to speak. Hello, he said. Hey, hey, she replied. He stared at her and was about to inquire more, but she continued, I am from Poland. My name is Agnieszka. What is your name? Jack, are you? But she interrupted him. I am suffering from the, how you say, homesickness. Can you help me? Then her bus came. I'll try, he called as she disappeared onto the bus. The next evening, he arrived with a small parcel which he presented to her. Thank you, Jack. What is this? It is saffron cake. Cornish finest. Taste it. She unwrapped the parcel and the glow of saffron shone on her face. She took a bite of the sweet dough, but the sadness descended almost immediately and she handed back the cake, shaking her head. Jack was determined to help her. The next day he brought her a pasty made from best beef and turnip. She eagerly took a taste and again her face fell. The following days he tried thunder and lightning, a cream tea, even baker tom bread and yarg cheese. And each time she looked at him with such anticipation, took a bite and her face fell again in disappointment. Then one evening he took a slightly different route to the bus stop along Old Bridge Street. Walking fast, a poster caught his eye saying Polish beer 99p. He stopped and stepped into the shop Inside, a group of people were standing around the chill counter, chattering in a language he couldn't understand. <clears throat> Excuse me, he said. They all turned and stared as he explained his predicament. As their ears engaged with his English, smiles emerged and suggestions poured forth. Chicken soup! Bigosh, pork cooked for a long time with cabbage, very delicious. Sausage, cabanos, from Schlonsk and bread, special Polish bread with an acid taste. So Jack bought a schlonka sausage and a loaf of Polish bread called Schlebwieski. He ran to the bus stop, anxious that he would miss her. She was there, her shoulders hunched against the persistent wintry mizzle. Agnieszka, I have bought this for you, he said, and handed her the parcel from the Polish shop. She looked unsure. Go on, open it. She fumbled with the wrapping, but as soon as her hands recognised the shape of the bread and sausage, her eyes saw their familiar colours and her nose breathed in the slightly acidic smell. A smile crept across her face. She pulled a piece of bread from the loaf, gnawed off a nub of sausage, wrapped the one in the other and began to eat. And as she did, the cloak of sadness lifted from her shoulders. Her deep blue eyes gazed at Jack as if she was seeing him for the first time. Jenkushe. Thank you. Would you like some? Well, I'll give it a go. And together they chewed on the bread and sausage. Their buses came and went, the mizzle ceased, the clouds parted, and Venus shone bright in the night sky. Ah, to cure the sickness of the heart. I am the song that sings the bird. I am the leaf that grows the land. I am the tide that moves the moon. I am the stream that halts the sand. I am the cloud that drives the storm. I am the earth that lights the sun. I am the fire that strikes the stone. I am the clay that shapes the hand. I am the word that speaks the man. 
We really hope you've enjoyed watching this Causley and Cornwall inspired piece as much as we've enjoyed performing it. We've loved being able to do this by a video, however we cannot wait until we can perform for you in person once more. Next up is another one of our favourite songs to see us out with the credits. And if you wait until the end, there's a little extra something. From the Story Republic, have a lovely summer. Dark the night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching longing for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother, some poor sailor tempest tossed. Trying now to reach the harbour In the darkness may be lost Let the lower lights be burning Send a gleam across the wave Some poor fainting struggling seamen You may rescue, you may save you may rescue, you may say. Jally Jim Jan. The Cornish man. Walked out on Bobmin Moor. A twist of rye for a collar and tie. And his boots on backseed wore. Jally Jim Jan. The children sang. Here's a letter from the King of Spain. But Janny turned nasty. Hit him with a pasty! And sent him home again. <laughs>